convergent computing where we talk about the Catalan FUS numbers. Or right, if you'd like to join us for dinner, you're most welcome at uh, the usual place, but please let me know right after the talk. Uh, all right. Hi. Hello. <coughs> start off by thanking you all for inviting me here and the host and all the rest of it. But actually, I realized this morning that it's my anniversary, 25 years. <laughs> and uh, Professor Zeilberger kindly invited me, would I stay for dinner after the talk this evening? And I said yes. So. Yes, I'm promoting that to my anniversary dinner tonight. <laughs> so, so anniversary I, I, of what? Not of your birthday. Twenty-five years of marriage. Ah, your wedding anniversary. Yes, yes. Congratulations! Exactly the day. <laughs> you said what your wife. And and. Uh, and you're still married now. I'm still married. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Fine. So yes, I already know. Today is going to be a good day. Yes. <laughs> so let me. Uh, all right. My, I guess the, the big connection between myself and my co-author Stephen Dilbert, let me write down his name. In fact, let me write down the names of various people here. Can you read that? Yes. yes. Okay, he was actually one year ahead of me at uh, Kennedy College in Cambridge University. Most of the friends who helped me, we are all students, former students at uh, Trinity Cambridge. And he, called, he emailed me one day with some problem on probability and statistics and said, are you interested in this? And he had derived uh, some recurrence relation. And I managed to solve that recurrence relation, found the general solution for the nth theorem. And he looked at that and he said, these look a lot like Catalan numbers. I showed my solution to various other people, and one of them replied saying, they are first Catalan numbers. Looked it up on Wikipedia and then I realized. And so that's what got started me on this business, and then one thing led to another more work. Eventually, uh, well, we published some papers, but wrote a manuscript, and uh, I was advised <coughs> by a colleague to contact Richard Stanley, who's a famous authority on Catalan numbers, and he gave me other names, and that led me to Zeilberger, and Zeilberger was very friendly, very enthusiastic about all this. And so, that I saw, he's a professor at Rutgers, and I said, well, I'm in New York City, well, I live on Long Island, uh, maybe we can meet one day, and I met him at Princeton for lunch one day, and he said, well, he organizes these weekly seminars, so uh, why don't you come and give a talk, and so that's how I came into, uh, come to be here. All right, now let's uh, okay get started with the uh, <coughs> Catalan numbers. And so the definition uh, Catalan numbers. So C of T is one over T plus one. Uh, 2t of t. And that, if you think about it, is 1 over 2t plus 1, 2t plus 1t. And there's a reason to prefer this one, <coughs> which I'll explain in a moment. Now, Catalan numbers are, have been claimed to be the most widely uh, used numbers in combinatorics after the binomial coefficients themselves. Uh, Stanley makes the claim in his book, and there's innumerable applications of these numbers. And from what I read in the literature, well, first Catalan numbers are a generalization of this. And for any application of Catalan numbers, there's a generalization to first Catalan. So the first Catalan numbers and what we do, <coughs> well, there's some notation that I have here. Um, is a t of u of r. 
Let's take that and you'll see the connection. 1 over T mu plus R. This is R. T mu plus R. Take this. Replace the 2 by mu. Replace the 1 by R. And that's R. And you see, this is, so it's a very obvious generalization. Uh, and that's why I said it's better to write the numbers in this form than in that form. Uh, <clears throat> and these are first catalog numbers. Okay. Uh, I promised you a short biographical sketch. I understand there's some mathematical theorem that no mathematical result is named after the person who discovered it or invented it or something. Nicholas Fuss lived before Catalan and published his numbers before Catalan. And Catalan came later with a special case, and he got his name first, and he's more famous. And so, uh, names. Uh, there's Lambert, Johann Lambert, you know the name? And he lived in the 1700s, and then he was a friend of Euler. And then came Nicholas. Nicholas of Number of Google is pi, what the direction of number. Yes. And then <coughs> came. Uh, Eugene, or Eugene, Charles Catalan, who lived, well, actually, I can write all this down, but you can find all the biographies of these people on Matt Tudor, and it's, there's no problem. But he, Lambert, actually wrote down the numbers, which I'll explain, the, which we recognize now as first Catalan numbers. Either did more work on that. First, actually solved a problem that I had been circulating around and wrote down the numbers as explicit uh, numbers, coefficients, and, so, and with a combinatorial, combinatorial interpretation. And then Catalan came later in the 1800s. So uh, this was in the 1700s, and he was in the 1800s. But anyway, all right. <clears throat> now, we have these numbers, but as it stands, um, we, I want to generalize this. I want to generalize this to the finite product, which I write as R over P factorial times a product of uh, G equals 1 up to T minus 1, T minus 1 of T T mu plus R minus J. And, uh, and this, if you work it out, can be written. And this can also be written down in terms of gamma functions. And the reason for doing this is because I want to generalize all of these to real numbers. And this can be done by expressing the binomial coefficients in terms of the gamma function. But that has problems of its own. If these numbers are zero or negative integers, then the ratio of gamma functions has to be defined by limits and all that. In this way of doing things, this is completely general. It never has a divide by zero problem or any uh, other ambiguity of interpretation problem. So this is the definition that I will use. Now, what is uh, so great about all this? Well, first of all, are the solution to this equation f equals one plus uh, sorry new f to the new. Oh, uh, I'll use the standard notation. Okay, I'm, I'm sure you all have uh, c for the complex numbers, r for the real numbers, and n for the natural numbers. Zero, one, one. So that should be obvious. Okay. So over here. Uh, Mu is a complex number, mu is a real number. And the solution of this equation, uh, this is the kind of problem that oil, that Lambert and then later Euler worked on. This can be solved in a series, and, and this doesn't have to be an integer. Okay, this can be a complex number. So uh, it's like a polynomial equation, except that this can be fractional, so it's more general. 
in this decoder Now, Lambert actually was the first to develop a serious solution for this. And I'll write down that answer. And it's conventional, not just to solve this, but to solve for the general nth power, f to the power of f to the power of r, r power. So f to the power of r is a sum from t equals 0 to infinity of a sub t of mu r. Uh, I think we don't really need this, just no. that should be obvious to all of you. Uh, mu to the power of t. Uh, and so this is the solution of uh, that equation. And these numbers, you see here, I want them to be, in general, I allow them to be complex numbers. So that's why I prefer this rather than that. Now, language in um, In 1758, he solved this equation, x to the m plus px equals q. And you can see that this equation is very similar to that, but this is the equation that he actually solved. He revisited the problem in data years and realized this can be simplified. We can write instead x equals q plus x to the m. So, these are the equations that Lambda used, that Lambda solved. And when I say m, Lambda did not assume that m is an integer. He used that notation, uh, but m could be arbitrary. Lagrange actually used this equation as the prototypical equation to demonstrate his Lagrange inversion theorem. When I contacted people, including Zeilberger, they all said, you can solve this using Lagrangian version. And this was actually the original example that Lagrange used. So I suppose Lagrange, his name should be down here also, but he didn't really contribute to these numbers. He used this and he came much later. But yes, so this, um, so this equation has attracted attention from people. And, and Lambert and Euler also derived series solutions for these equations. And, and got these coefficients, but they didn't give them a name, or they, they didn't really recognize them as a special function or a special number. Uh, first did that, and then Catalan came later. Now, let's, so let's go back to, uh, where shall we put this? I already went from page one to page three, but, Okay, from there, let's write down the generating function. And that is V of mu R Z. And that is the sum of A, well, it's the sum over T equals 0 to infinity of T V R Z to Z. So that solution is a generating function of uh, the Catala, first Catalan numbers. Okay, fine. Now this <coughs> function b, it actually has a very remarkable property that if I put mu, if I put r equal to one, uh, or rather b mu r of z is equal to b of mu one of z raised to the power r. Actually, uh, oh, by the way, the big reference for first Catalan numbers is this uh, textbook by um, Graham, Knuth, and Fantastic. It's called Concrete Mathematics. I can give you, the references are in the handout. You can look them up. But this is an amazing property that the first Catalan numbers have this property. And so this is one identity. It's a special case, actually, or it's equivalent to saying that b of mu r z times b of mu s z equals b of mu r plus s z. That should be reasonably obvious that these two are equivalent statements. There's a convolution identity with a so convolution. Uh, 
uh, the A mu of R plus S is equal to the sum of A mu uh, sorry A A T of R plus S is A of U of R of mu R I forgot the mu here uh, times A of T minus U of mu S so here we sum from U equals 0 up to T so that's the convolution is on these indices and there's also a recurrence relation, but never mind. You, you can look that in the handout. In, in the handout. Uh, but okay, so now all of this is the first scatter numbers. Now I said that in the talk, multi-parameter first scatter numbers. Okay, so where does that come from? Go to this equation and say, all right, why do we stop with only one parameter? Let's have mu one f of mu one plus. Oh, is that okay, or do you want me to write fresh equations? Or oh, if I just overwrite like this? Mu2 f of mu2 f uh, plus mu of a f. So I have k parameters where k is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, then what's the answer? The answer is given by what I call, and this is my own terminology, multi-parameter test catalog. So to do that, <coughs> look at this one, and so what we have is a of a of t of mu r is one over t t factorial r r uh, times the finite product of t times mu plus r minus j. Define a set of k tuples. Define t as t1, t2, up to tk. Define mu as mu1, mu2, up to mu k. And define the magnitude of t as just, uh, these are non-negative integers, they're just T1 plus T2 plus up to T of K. Okay? And then the generalization is just K of T. Well, I could just put it there. Of mu. R already means an integer. And this becomes R over T1 factorial, T2 factorial, TK factorial. And this becomes an inner product of uh, t vector dotted with mu vector plus r minus j. And, uh, and this sum is a sum over all these multiple indices. But I just write it as or, or this product. But OK. Uh, it's a very straightforward generalization. And this generalization. If I go back to here and I say, here is this equation, all I have to do, this is now a sum over k-dimensional states. And this becomes mu1 to the power of t1, mu2 to the power of t2, mu k to the power of t k. It's as simple as that. Now when I say it's as simple as that, uh, now we get into some sociology. When I was reading all these different papers, this is one of the problems that I found with this uh, Catalan numbers and first Catalan number literature. All these theorems and all that I told you, they've all been proved in the literature. Each person proves it and doesn't reference anybody else. And so there's a lot of duplication of proofs of all these theorems. And, and each person will define uh, give a definition that's for his specific application. And so there are conflicting definitions. And a lot of people define the first catalog numbers with r equals to 1 only. They don't, <coughs> they don't treat r equals 
the general number. And that's really not, it's unnecessarily restrictive. Actually, Stanley does that in his book. He defines the first Kabbalah number, and he only puts R equal to 1. And that's really not good enough for uh, more general applications. And all these theorems, different people have proved them and reproved them. The, oh, and um, Professor Zalberg asked me, okay, if I have all of this series, a lot of these numbers, not, not necessarily to be complex numbers, but let them be indeterminates and let this be a formal power series. And can I prove that? But actually that was proved by George Rainey in 1960. He gave, I think, the most comprehensive of all the different proofs that I have seen, where he allowed these things to be not just complex numbers or whatever, but coefficients in a commutative ring, which includes things like formal power series and indeterminates. So what Zeilberger asked has been proved. And, and these things don't have to be uh, specific numbers. They can be objects, elements in a commutative ring. And all of this will work and has been proved. Uh, where are those identities? This is also true. <clears throat> Just put a tilde here, and a tilde here, and a tilde under the z also. z becomes a k group. And all of these theorems are true. And uh, this becomes a tuple here. This becomes a vector sum of them. And all of these theorems are true if you use that definition very simply. If you generalize things in this way, this is the definition that I am telling to you. There are, as I said, many definitions by many people, and they make unnecessary restrictions that something has to be an integer or r has to equal 1 or this or that. Uh, and all of those different definitions I can show are special cases of this, this general definition. But this, as such, you will not find in the literature. You'll find special cases by different people, but, but this will include all of those definitions. All right, <clears throat> so where are we? Well, I've introduced for you the first scalar numbers and now the multi-parameter first scalar numbers. And there are, oh, this generating function, as you can imagine, it generalizes in this way, and that's the sum, and that's the sum, and that's the sum, and then this is e1 to the t1, z2 to the t1, z2 to the t2. Everything will generalize in a straightforward way if you apply that definition. All the necessary indices that you need, all the necessary degrees of freedom to sum over the different parameters, all will be available if you do things this way. Uh, so that's uh, something to bear in mind. And I already explained, oh, okay. One, two, three, four, is number All right, uh, it should be reasonably obvious that Algebraic equations, polynomial equations, are a special case of this equation. So an algebraic equation, then, it's um, is that okay if I write on here? So what's the general algebraic equation? I mean, it's just a0 plus a1 x plus a2 x squared plus a to the n x to the n equals 0. It's a special case of that equation. And as I explained to you, Lambert saw this equation and later on he saw that equation. Euler wrote down a similar equation, just let's try something to keep writing down. Um, Ramanujan also actually. Uh, briefly mentioned to solve this equation in one of his, I think in his first notebook. But <coughs> in the sense of a series, infinite series. In, yes, yeah. the, the same series that Lambert had uh, derived. Now Ramanujan actually gave a correct formula 
for the radius of convergence of the series. Lambda and Euler, they lived long ago. They wrote down the series, but they didn't consider uh, the convergence of the series or anything like that. Uh, in later years, people who worked on complex analysis, uh, they, they want to solve this equation. And uh, Menon, so I suppose I should put a line here. You know about the Menon transform. It's related to the Laplace transform. It's the same Menon in 1915. Uh, he used complex analysis to solve this. And he got, he got these coefficients, but he didn't recognize uh, that these were numbers that had been derived by other people before. In fact, as far as I can tell, Menon only cited himself, his earlier papers. He never seemed to cite anyone else, at least when he was working on this subject. Yes, it was very strange. Um, but Burkeland, uh, I think German, how would he pronounce it? Well, he used Menon's solution and gave an improved bound. Mellon gave a, a sufficient but very restrictive bound for convergence. Birkeland gave a more general but still sufficient but not necessary bound for convergence. Um, then in later years, in 2002, uh, two people, Mikhail Passari and August Sik, they gave a necessary and sufficient bound. But there was a mistake in their result. I found the corrected result, wrote up a manuscript, circulated it to people, blah, blah, blah. We end up with Zeilberger, we end up with me over here. That's work in progress. All right, enough. Uh, <coughs> but, I'm sorry. Stouffer's had a paper on solutions of such equations for n equals 5 right. in uh, hyper generalized hyperdermetic series. Oh, oh, many people have worked on solutions of this. The printed, especially. Oh, I should have written that down. And uh, uh, yes. he was actually quoted to German paper in the 19th century, but basically. But uh, many people have solved the algebraic equation using hypergeometric functions. And there are relationships between the first Catalan uh, generating function, this series, and uh, hypergeometric functions. Uh, yes, and the Quintic especially has attracted a lot of attention. Uh, Klein in the 19th century solved the Quintic using some geometric technique with the icosahedron and so on. Uh, so this. So I'm not saying that the first Catalan number is the only way to solve those equations. There are many other uh, techniques, and many other people have worked on them. And uh, in all cases, the, the domain of convergence is uh, prevalent. Uh, but yes. And then we come back to that. So Beta is now back on non commutative analogs of Catalan numbers. So maybe you can do not commutative analogs with my general proof. Let's see. Uh, but anyway, let me write down then uh, the quintic. <clears throat> well, the general quintic, you just stop at n equals 5. But I think you all know that you can shift the roots of any polynomial equation and make the sum of the roots, of the shifted roots, add up to 0. And if you do that, you can knock out one coefficient in the polynomial. Uh, that's a special case of what is called a Schirnhaus transformation. So you can just shift x to x plus the constant. But you can do a quadratic and remove two coefficients, or a cubic or a quadric. It stops there because with a quintic you can't solve in radicals, but it can be done. And so, anyway, the, all right, so the quintic, the principal quintic, the principal quintic normal form is A0 plus A1 of x plus 